From beginning to end, the Bible reveals a God who is relentlessly pursuing and bestowing favor on undeserving humanity. And we're part of that. All of us are part of that. God is continually patient and loving and kind and compassionate to all people. Matter of fact, Jesus said this of the Father, that he makes the sun shine on the evil and good and he causes it to rain on the just and the unjust. God loves you no matter what. He loves you. God is working to overwhelm us with himself, and it's called being gracious. And as we read throughout the scriptures, God is always and constantly and will forever be until Jesus returns, inviting us to share in his grace. That's what he wants. So that we will experience salvation and then in turn that his grace will transform us into gracious people. I don't always want to lump you or, or put you into the same boat that, boat that I'm in, but I, I would imagine you are in this. We need to be more gracious. We need to be a more gracious people. Listen to the overwhelming way in which God describes himself. Matter of fact, the, the few verses I'm going to read, they're the most often requoted uh, Old Testament passage that God uses to describe himself. Exodus 34 and verse 6, the first time that, it's, uh, that, that God uh, pronounces or says these words, he's describing himself as he's hiding Moses in the cleft of the rock. And he says, the Lord, it says, the Lord passed by him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Nehemiah 9 and verse 17, but you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Psalm 86 and verse 15 says, But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast faithfulness. Psalm 103 and verse 8, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And then one more, Joel 2 and verse 13 says, Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Do you get the idea that God wants us to know something about himself? God says this about himself. He describes, this is the way he describes himself over and over and over throughout Scripture. And among all those descriptions in there, we find the word gracious. God is gracious. Last week we looked at that, how faithful that he is to us. And that we, our response is to, to that faithfulness is uh, our faithfulness to him. And this morning we're going to look at this idea or this concept, the, a spiritual fact, reality, that God is gracious. And if we're going to be more gracious people, we need to know what it means for God to be gracious. And so I'm going to look at just for a minute what, how this word is used uh, in the Bible. The Old Testament word for grace is K-H-E-N, and I've been told you pronounce it this way, that you say the word hen while clearing your throat. Hen. I don't know if I get it right or not, but that's, it, makes, it sounds good anyways. But it means favor, delightful, or elegance. And we see it used in several verses. Psalm 45 and verse 2, the psalmist says, You are the most handsome of the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. The words of this poet are, uh, uh, attract the attention and the favor of those who hear his words. They say that, you know, it's the idea of elegant words or graceful words or delightful words. Concerning the father's instruction and the mother's teaching, it's this idea of wisdom. Uh, we're told in Proverbs 1 and verse 9, for they are, great, they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. Wisdom is metaphorically a, a beautiful necklace that draws the attention and the favor of others. When people know and recognize you are wise, they come to you. 
They want advice. They want, they want to hear uh, from you. They, they have questions for you and they, they seek your advice. Uh, we're told in Esther 2 in verse 17 that the king loved Esther more than all the women and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins so that, she, uh, that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. The king found Esther to be elegant, to be someone full of grace. She was delightful. And because of that, she caught his attention and he favored her for that reason. Then later, as we read, uh, continue to read the, the book of Esther, she comes before the king of, again and asks a request in chapter 7 and verse 3. And she informs him of Haman's plot. And it says, Then the queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. And so the king favors her and he grants her her request because he is motivated by this feeling of favor and delight or grace that he has towards her. In Genesis 33, we see this idea again. And we get to the heart of what it means to be gracious. The, the most extreme example or display of grace is, is giving favor to someone who should not get that. They should, they should receive something else, something terrible, something horrible should actually happen to them because that's what they deserve. But instead, favor and delight and grace is shown towards them. And you, you remember the story how Jacob swindles his brother Esau. He cheats him. And he finally runs away and he's gone for a, a number of years and he has a family and great uh, possessions and herds. And as he's about to meet Esau again for the, for the first time after being separated for such a long time, he puts some of his family in front of him and he puts some of his, his herd in front of him. And here's what Esau said. What do you mean by all this company that I met? Jacob answered, to find favor in the sight of my Lord. Jacob isn't asking for what's fair. He's asking to find favor. He's asking for his brother Esau to be gracious. And so Esau is gracious. And he delights in his brother. And he extends grace to him, which he does not deserve. But he decides to be gracious. The New Testament word is charis. means goodwill. Uh, a loving kindness. You're probably familiar with this word. You've probably seen it uh, before. Uh, and it, it's that which gives joy and pleasure and delight. And speaking of those who are, are chosen by grace, Paul said, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. If God was loving and kind and, and, and only took pleasure in us, if and when we deserved it, Paul says, then God wouldn't be loving and kind and gracious. This is shown, grace is shown uh, when it's not deserved. That's the idea or the concept behind grace. You are gracious to someone. You delight in them. You have favor. You show goodwill towards them when they've done everything against you that would sell or, or tell your, your mind and your heart otherwise. Everything they do towards you would say, don't be gracious to me. Seek revenge. Get me back. Uh, turn your, your back on me. But if we're going to be gracious... We treat people the way God would treat them. God delights in humanity and so he shows us goodwill and loving kindness when we don't deserve it. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3, uh, or 13 and 14. Paul says, Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, <clears throat> An insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. What did Paul deserve? 
nothing good. The wrath of God, I guess we would say. But because God is gracious, that is what he found in God, was grace and goodwill and favor. God delighted in him. God wants the very best for him and for us. And so when he sought God, that's what he found. He met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and Jesus was gracious to him. Hebrews 2 and verse 9 says, But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God we might taste death for everyone. The Bible tells us we deserve death, but by the grace of God, because he delights in us and finds favor in us, he sent Jesus to die for us so that we don't have to experience spiritual and eternal death. He's gracious. We look at Ephesians 2, 4 through 8, and here's what the, the Bible says. <clears throat> but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, this is the idea, even when we were living in rebellion to him, even when we found no delight in him, even when we wanted everything else except him, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. God is gracious. Grace is a gift of delight and favor that is freely given to someone who does not deserve it. And we have experienced that. If you're a child of God, you have experienced that. And you know what that is like. But it is in Jesus that, that God's grace is personified. God, or grace requires a generous spirit. Which sometimes we have. Sometimes we have that. On a good day, we have a generous spirit. On a good day, we, we're kind towards others. But in the Bible, the one who shows grace more than anyone else is God. God consistently looks upon us with favor. God treasures us, and, and he doesn't show us favor because we deserve it. He shows us favor because he's gracious. There's no other reason. It's never because we deserve it. It's never because we've done enough. It's never because we've been good enough. It's never because we've followed the law more often than not or, or fill in the blank. God's gracious to us. We receive grace because God is gracious. That's why. We lie. We cheat. We steal. We kill. It's almost like we go out of our way to show God, don't be gracious to me. Don't favor me. Don't delight in me. But in spite of our sin, God is still gracious. No matter what I say, no matter what I do, God is gracious. God delights in us. And we see the grace of God perfectly and holy uh, and, and absolutely personified in Jesus. Titus 2, verse 11, it was read just a minute ago. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Romans 1, 1 through 5 tells us we receive grace in Jesus. John 1 and verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is God's grace in human form. And every aspect of grace is seen in Jesus. Every aspect of it. He is God's favor. He is God's delight. He is God's goodwill and loving kindness come down from heaven to show us the grace of God. 
and what it means to be gracious. And that God took joy and pleasure in giving his son for us. Hebrews 12 and verse 2, for the joy set before him, it tells us he endured the cross. It's not that he found uh, joy in hanging on the cross and, and everything, the pain and suffering that, that happened to him, but the outcome, he knew what it was going to provide and he endured it with joy. Because through that, God extends grace. Jesus has graciously rescued us from death through his death and has given us life through his life. And when we turn to God in faith and we're willing to admit our sin and ask for grace, God gives us the gift of himself. We're told that when we're immersed into Jesus, our sins are forgiven and we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Grace is not something that God gives us apart from Himself. He gives us Himself. God desires we learn from Him and that we become gracious. And so we need to be more gracious. We need... Uh, we, we, look, we need to be kind. This is the idea of being beneficial to one another. Tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Colossians 3 and verse 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts. That's the idea of being moved deeply from within. Kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. We're told, do not overcome evil by evil, but overcome evil with good. Our human tendency, if someone is rude to us, be rude to them. If someone says something mean to us, say something mean to them. But God says, if someone's mean or rude to you, overcome that evil with good. Be gracious. Graciousness, or, or here's another one, uh, do not resist the one who is evil. In other words, don't, don't become his opponent, don't become his enemy, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Do what you can to show grace, do what you can to be Jesus to that person. Graciousness is a sign of spiritual maturity because it requires a generous and patient and kind spirit. And if we're honest with ourselves, we're constantly at work with that. And we don't show it perfectly. Matter of fact, matter of fact it's, sometimes it feels like we, we mess up more times than what we get it right. But God's gracious. And he forgives. And he's at work within our lives helping grow and cultivate this characteristic of, of graciousness and being gracious to others. You have to put yourself, if you're going to be gracious, you have to try and you have to be able to put yourselves in the shoes or in the circumstances of others and actively seek their goodwill and be beneficial to them. That's what Jesus did. Read the Gospels. You see over and over and over how Jesus treats others. You can't harbor resentment and hold a grudge and be gracious at the same time impossible they're mutually exclusive that's like trying to say that darkness and light dwell in the same place you can't are you a gracious person i'm glad you want to know let's find out i got three questions for you how are you inclined to view and treat others who aren't like you maybe people who look differently than you, maybe people who are a different economic um, uh, status than you, maybe people who don't hold the same religious uh, uh, ideas that you hold, maybe people who don't hold the same political views that you hold. We could go on and on and, and, and again, 
How are you inclined, what is the knee-jerk reaction to treat people who are different than you, process things different than you, have a different world view than what you have? Number two, how do you respond when others wrong you? When you find out someone who has said something negative about you or, or slandered you or spread a rumor about you or, or someone's trying to, to get ahead of you and, and, and take something that maybe is rightfully yours. Well, again, what is the knee-jerk reaction? How do you respond when someone else has wronged you? Are you gracious to them? Number three, do you delight in treating others better than they deserve. Is that the way you want to treat others? I want to treat people better than they deserve. I don't know if I can always say that. But I know God does. Because I'm the recipient of His grace. And He's constantly being gracious to me. Are you a gracious person? How are you uh, uh, inclined to view and treat others who aren't like you? How do you respond when others wrong you? And do you delight in treating others better than they deserve? When we experience God's generous gift of grace, it transforms us into gracious people. People who take joy and pleasure in bestowing goodwill and favor on others, especially when they don't deserve it and don't have the ability to reciprocate that. I'm not gracious to people just so they can be gracious to me. God isn't good to us just so we will be gracious or good to Him. He wants that. He wants us to be gracious. But even while I was in rebellion to Him, He was gracious to me. And when we live in God's graciousness, We become God's grace personified to others. A couple years ago, my family and I, uh, we started a ministry called Bread and Bibles. I didn't start it. It wasn't unique to me. It wasn't my idea. I can't take uh, credit for it. But the idea was that we would go to some of the local grocery stores in town. We would take all the bread, if they would graciously give it to us, uh, that they were about to throw out. You know, they pull it off the shelf every so often, they get rid of it. And we were going to take that, and we were going to take Bibles, and we set up on the side of the road in, in places that we thought that people would want this kind of stuff, and uh, we would hand it out. Bread and Bibles. We had a couple Bible studies with a few people, uh, but I'll, I'll never remember one lady pulled up. She immediately got out of her car, and she looked at me, with this very skeptical look on her face, and her first words were, why are you doing this? (laughs) And I said, because we love God and we love people. That was it. That's it. Wasn't doing it for any other reason. Church, our world is familiar with the word grace. Grace. They are not familiar with people being gracious. They know the word grace. They just don't know gracious people. And hopefully, that doesn't describe us. Hopefully, we are gracious people. We need to be gracious people. This morning, if you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, if you're ready to experience grace, if you're ready to be forgiven of your sins, washed away, never to be brought up and held against you again, if you're ready for your conscience to be purged of guilt and shame, you can experience the grace of God this morning by repenting of your sins, being immersed into Jesus for the forgiveness of those sins, raised to walk a new life, as a child of God, with the Spirit of God within you, and experience His grace, you can do that this morning. If you've already become a child of God, you know you've experienced the grace of God, but you've walked away from it, or you've shunned it, or you haven't wanted to be a part of it, and you pursued your own self, and and you've become selfish, and you're ready to turn back to God and let Him be 
gracious to you again. He met, well, he has, he's never stopped being gracious to you. But you're ready to experience grace again. You can do that this morning. Whatever your need is, please come forward while we stand and while we sing.